You were a code cracker I was. until you got fired. Well, I did how, get fired, yes. How come? <laughs> well, how come? Uh, <laughs> I got fired because, um, uh, well, the Vietnam War was on, and the, the boss of bosses in my organization was a big fan of the war and wrote a New York Times article, uh, magazine section cover story about how we're going to win in Vietnam and so on. And I didn't like that war. I thought it was stupid, and I wrote a letter to the Times, which they published, uh, saying not everyone who works for, it was, it was Maxwell Taylor, if anyone remembers that name, works for General Taylor, uh, agrees with his views. And I gave my own views. Okay, and, so that, know, I well, can see that would... <laughs> which were different from uh, General Taylor's. But on the other hand, nobody said anything. But then, you know, I was 29 years old at this time, and some kid came around to said he was a stringer from Newsweek magazine, and he wanted to interview me and ask my what I was doing about my views, and I told him that, I said, I'm doing mostly mathematics now, and when the war is over, then I'll do mostly their stuff. Then I did the only intelligent thing I'd done that day. I uh, told my local boss that I gave that interview, and he said, what did you say? And I told him what I said. And then uh, he said, I got to call Taylor. He called Taylor. That took 10 minutes. I was fired five minutes after that. Okay. So, but it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad, because you, no. went, you went on to Stony Brook and um, I went on stepped to, up your, yeah, your, yeah. your mathematical career. And you started working with, um, with this man here. Who, who is this? Oh, Chern. Yeah, Chern was uh, one of the great mathematicians of the, of the century. I, I had known him uh, when I was a graduate student, actually, at Berkeley. And uh, I had some ideas, and I brought them to him, and he liked them. And uh, together, we did this work, which uh, you can easily uh, see up there. There, there, there it is. And <laughs> it led to you publishing uh, a famous paper together. Can you explain at all what that work was? No. no. Oh. <laughs> well, I'll mean, tell you what, can you explain I mean, this? I could explain it to somebody. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, but, how about explaining this? I, I, but, but not many, not many people. <laughs> I think you told me it had something to do with spheres. So let's, let's, start, let's start here. Well, it did, but, but I, I, I'll say about that work, um, it did have something to do with that. But before we get to that, that work was, uh, was good mathematics. I was very happy with it. So was Chern. Uh, it even started a little subfield that's now flourishing. But more interestingly, uh, it happened to apply to physics, something we knew nothing about. At least I knew nothing about physics, and I don't think Chern knew a heck of a lot. And uh, about 10 years after the paper came out, uh, a guy named Ed Witten in, in Princeton started applying it to string theory, and people in Russia started applying it to what's called condensed matter. And today, that, those things in there called chern simons invariants spread through a lot of physics, and it was amazing. We didn't know any physics. It never occurred to me that it would be applied to physics. But that's the thing about mathematics. You never know where it's going to go. But this is so incredible. So you know, we've been talking about how evolution shapes human minds that may or may not perceive the truth. Somehow, you come up with a mathematical theory, not knowing any physics, discover two decades later that it's being applied to profoundly describe the actual physical world. Yeah. How, how can that happen? God knows. Yeah, but but, uh, <laughs> but there's a, there was a famous physicist named Wigner, and he wrote a, uh, an essay on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. So somehow this mathematics, which is rooted in the real world in some sense, you know, we learn to count and measure, that kind of, everyone would do that. And then it flourishes on its own, but so often it comes back to save the day General relativity is an example. Minkowski had this geometry, and Einstein realized, hey, it's the very thing in which I can cast general relativity. So uh, you never know, and, and so it is a mystery. It is a mystery. So here's, here's a mathematical piece of ingenuity here. Tell, tell us about this. Yeah, yeah, well this, well that's a ball. <laughs> it's, a, it's a sphere, and it has a lattice around it, you know, those squares, sort of things. <laughs> and um, what I'm gonna show here was originally uh, observed by Euler, the great mathematician, in the 1700s. And it gradually grew to be a very important field in mathematics 
algebraic topology and geometry. And that paper up there uh, was, had its roots in this. So, okay, so here's this thing. It has eight vertices and 12 edges and six faces. And if you look at the difference, vertices minus edges plus faces, you get two. Okay, well, two, that's a good number. Oh, here's a different way of doing it. These are triangles covering. Oh, this has 12 vertices and 30 edges and uh, 20 faces, 20 tiles, and vertices minus edges plus faces still equals two. And in fact, you could do this any which way. Cover this thing with all kinds of polygons and triangles and mix them up. And you take vertices minus edges plus faces, you'll get two. Now, here's a different shape. This is a torus or the surface of a donut. 16 vertices covered by these rectangles. 32 edges, 16 faces. Hey, they, this comes out zero vertices minus edges. It'll always come out zero. Every time you cover a torus with squares or triangles or anything like that, you're going to get a, a zero when you take that thing. So, this is called the Euler characteristic, and it's what's called a topological invariant. Now, it's pretty amazing. No matter how you do it, you're always going to get the same answer. So that was the first sort of thrust from the mid-1700s into a subject which is now called algebraic topology. And, and your own work took an idea like this and moved it into higher dimensional Theory. Well, you looked well, at higher were, dimensional yeah. objects and found new invariances? Yes. Well, there were already higher dimensional invariants, uh, Pont Pontryagin classes. Uh, actually, there were Chern classes. There were a, a bunch of these types of invariants. But I, I was struggling to work on one of them and model it sort of combinatorially instead of the way it was typically done. And that led to this work, and oh. we uncovered some, some new things. But if it wasn't for Mr. Euler, who wrote almost 70 volumes of mathematics, had 13 children whom he had apparently would dandle up on his knee while he was writing and so on. Uh, uh, if it wasn't for Mr. Euler, well, uh, uh, there wouldn't perhaps be these invariants.